And for all of you who have joined in today for the webinar, uh, you're entitled to a 10% uh, discount for our next masterclass that is going to happen on the 30th of July. Uh, that is called the Beginner's Guide to Cryptocurrencies. And uh, yeah, so it's on Thursday, 30th of July from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And you can register by following the link. And I will add the link also on the comment section. So uh, briefly about ITRE, who is uh, organizing today's webinar. So we are supporting digital transformation in Asia. And we are pioneers and leaders in tech learning. And at ITRE, we believe in two core principles. The power of technology to shape the future and help us build a better world and that love of learning is the source of human ingenuity and well-being. And our goal, which is backed by government and academia, is to fast-track Asian businesses with the latest technology applications and know-how. So uh, currently we are rolling out courses in mobile development, blockchain, data science, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, FinTech, digital marketing, and cybersecurity. And about all these courses, you can find out more on our website, www.itrend.com.mi. And uh, there you will also find that some of the courses are currently rolled out online. And you can also join for the master classes that are um, um, less than, our usual courses are five days. So the master classes would be a half day session where you'll learn the hands-on experience and skills you can use in your businesses or build your startups by learning how to how to code and how to build a blockchain and as you can see we have had, had the opportunity to empower businesses across many strategic sectors such as finance technology industry and manufacturing and uh, yes so that is it from me and uh, once again if you have any questions uh, during the webinar for Harpreet you can write them in the comments section and the questions will be answered after the webinar. So thank you for your attention and I will give the floor to Harpreet. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. So uh, yes. first, first of all, thank you everybody for joining in uh, the webinar today. Uh, so we'll be discussing on what are the opportunities and challenges that are uh, dropping in into blockchain sector. So, but uh, before I begin, let me uh, introduce myself. So, my name is Harpreet Singh Man. I'm the CEO of, and co-founder of uh, Blockline, which is a blockchain development company based out of Sabajaya. Uh, and I'm also the CTO of Verifizer. I hold various other positions to advocate for blockchain adoption in Malaysia, some in the ISO committee, MDAC, and many others. And I also advise multiple companies on blockchain strategies and adoption strategies, and also uh, governments as well. In short, I'll just say that I'm more of a techie, um, you know, like really deep into blockchain technology for the past few years, and then later on noticed that I can bring more value being an entrepreneur. So, uh, and uh, before we, before I begin, because today is going to be a quite a long topic, so I thought of like maybe going quickly into the slides uh, and uh, and explaining what exactly is blockchain. Usually I leave this for my master classes or for my full day classes to explain what is blockchain. But for the benefit of all the people who's joining in the webinar today, I felt that maybe we should talk about blockchain and what it is uh, briefly, because a lot of times when you're talking about blockchain outside, actually people do not understand how the technology behaves and how the technology works and what are the problems it's solving. So they do not know or they could not value what they're gonna learn in a blockchain masterclass or in a cryptocurrency masterclass. So that's the reason I, I thought that maybe today, in, in, uh, well, since we are doing this webinar, it is, it's actually much more beneficial to actually talk a bit about blockchain first and then moving into what are the opportunities and challenges uh, which are coming up in this ecosystem. So I think without wasting much time, let's get into it. So first of all, what exactly is blockchain? If you've been you know, like hearing about blockchain became a buzzword for the past two years, where a lot of people are talking about uh, the technology and the technology is going to revolutionize the whole world, is going to change this, is going to change that. But often, actually, if you really sit down and ask somebody, you know, like uh, who's even in the technology space, even a software engineer, what exactly is a blockchain, either he will say that he do not understand or he do not know 
or there is a possibility he will give you a definition of blockchain that he read it online that might not be the most accurate definition because one of the problems in the space is definitions are still being defined. It's a very relatively quite new eco, uh, industry, although Bitcoin has been around for 11 years, but the whole blockchain as an industry really started to formalize in the last four to five years where you start to see a lot new development that actually uh, kind of uh, speed up a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the development in the space and most importantly why actually it exists every technology is there to solve a problem in you know like a, a problem that we face or a problem uh, you know like that we require solutions like this so that's the reason I think I think then uh, before I get into blockchain I actually would like to see why does blockchain even exist so in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, a lot of people kind of really started to mistrust of the existing financial systems, the government, the banks. So this is uh, nothing to do with the technology. It's just a backstory. So if you look into understanding in a movie why a character behaves in a certain way or why uh, you need to know what is the backstory of those character. And in this case, you actually can better understand why is he taking such judgments or why is he behaving in certain way in that particular movie plot, right? Similarly here, you actually have to understand the backstory about blockchain to understand why was it designed that way and what are the problems it was designed to solve and how can we take the concepts, the ideas of blockchain, the technology itself and mold it into solving other problems that we face in on our day-to-day -day lives. So in the aftermath of 2008 financial crisis, there was a lot of mistrust in the financial system. A lot of the we where they saw that a lot of the financial players basically played around with a lot of the value system, a lot of money, and later just got away without really any any of the consequences. So in this case, people tend to um, they a lot of people tend to ideate how can they actually improve, uh, you know, like the whole financial system. Some decided to digitize and started to do financial technologies like fintech. And you can see after that, a lot of fintech ideas and payment concepts and digital banks started to come up where they had a, a better governance structure. They had more control, more visibility, more digital approach was taken in some banks. And there was also a community or society where they were looking into, you know, like doing financial or having an alternative financial system where they basically do not rely on the financial system that exists. They wanted an alternate uh, option to basically uh, to do a lot of their day-to-day -day business and trading. So people started to go and explore. There was actually some ideas and some exploration before 2008 as well, early 2005, 2006, 2007. There was a number of papers that was released. People were talking about peer-to-peer -peer currencies, peer-to-peer -peer money, internet money. And, but it never really picked off because they never had a technology backbone that actually can allow uh, you know, like decentralized currencies where you, instead of just relying on one server running all the financial uh, you know, like calculations and keeping everybody's accounts, you rely on multiple servers in the network and have uh, trust and also at the same time have the resilience that nobody can cheat or hack the network. There was no technology that was available back then. And at the same time, there was no technology that was available to identify if somebody is tampering with your data, right? So imagine if you keep an information, uh, you know, like a, in, in a server, if anybody comes in and edit it uh, and you have no record of it. So let's say if I can go in into a bank account and just change my account number and add additional zeros in my bank account and I can become a millionaire overnight. So it, 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 there's basically uh, not stopping anybody, right? In this case, everybody will start becoming millionaire the next day. There's no uh, credibility to such financial system. But today, how even today and even back then in 2008, a lot of the financial systems that exist, they were mainly just databases. They were maintained by few authorities. And in this case, they usually keep the logs and the backups of it. But let's say if there was a rogue DBA or you know, like anybody at the back want to change any databases, they can do it. And there was no transparency. There was one of the reasons where the subprime mortgages actually failed because a lot of the facts and figures of the actual assets was not clear to the investors. So the uh, subprime mortgages was performing bad, but since they were repackaged 
and sold in a different asset and repackaged again and sold in a different asset, the investors of the assets thought that the market is booming. But actually, no, people were suffering and they could not pay their mortgages, which later on when the bubble burst, everybody lost money because there was not enough transparency in the ecosystem. So you notice there was like two centrally controlled, no transparency, and there was a need for an alternative ecosystem for where people can rely on instead of putting on their money on the main ecosystem or the main financial system, they want people wanted an alternative financial system. So there was a newcomer into the space who came, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, an anonymous person, uh, in in uh, who came up on Reddit and he started to post a lot of his uh, Bitcoin uh, white paper and started to discuss about the idea of having a cryptocurrency where it is a peer-to-peer -peer payment network. Instead of real, and it can actually disintermediate uh, banks and actually do payment and have a value system between the people. That's why the idea of Bitcoin started to become very appealing when it was f right after the financial crisis, where people already had a lot of mistrust on the government. They had a lot of mistrust on the financial system and the way it operated because they felt that okay, if I'm gonna keep my money there, you know, like uh, it, it, and it's it's not, I, and I can't preserve my value. And, I, and all of my hard work, uh, hard earned money can value can just be wiped off in the night. I, I, a lot of people felt a lot, a lot of insecurity was there. So people felt that maybe they want to test on an alternative system. That way when Bitcoin idea was introduced back in uh, January 2009, it was very appealing to a big segment of audience that they maybe would want to test out an alternative system. But one of the main changes here, why the uh, peer-to-peer the -peer currency is before it doesn't work, because Bitcoin actually introduced a new form of technology. But before I go into that, I actually would like to share a bit of my personal story of uh, exploring and identifying Bitcoin as well. So I was actually looking into Bitcoin, never bought it, was just exploring it back in 2012 when the price was about $15 to $16. It was actually booming. It went to like about from $12 to $83 by the time I was just observing it. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. This is this market space is either it's a bubble or it's a scam. And I was just like, I was very uh, uh, skeptical about this whole uh, ecosystem back then because it was a bit too early. And I was uh, still, uh, and I was actually observing it. And I felt that maybe I, I, I just don't get it why people was investing so much of money into cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin back then. So I... After just looking into it, I say, like, wait, why do actually uh, most of the money and most of the currencies in the world have value? I decided to ask that question. So I went back and started to do research on why, you know, like Malaysian ringgit has value or why dollar have value or why the most expensive currencies in the world, uh, you know, like if we talk about uh, Kuwaiti dinars or we talk about uh, Omani rials, why do they have value and why are they highly priced? Why are they priced that way? So I actually started to study a bit of the economics, study a bit of the uh, a bit of the way you do issuance, the way you maintain the money, and and suddenly Bitcoin started Bitcoin's economics started to make sense to me on how uh, uh, Bitcoin as a financial system could work. But where I really saw the gold mine was, it was in the technology. But before we get into the technology, I think I would just like to conclude on Bitcoin. It's a people's digital cryptocurrency. Uh, people's uh, digital cryptocurrency, uncensorable and unbiased. So in this case, uh, they worried that uh, Bitcoin will meet the same fate as a lot of the earlier P2P currencies where they can be tracked and shut down. So they decided to be a more uncensorable, unbiased, anonymous, pseudonymous kind of cryptocurrency ecosystem where people can track uh, who are the people behind it so that nobody can be caught or penalized for using it. And a system of decentralized trust Instead of focusing on a central point or thinking that Satoshi Nakamoto will be managing it, he just said, "No, I'm going to be. Uh, I'm not going to manage it. The community going to manage it, and I'm I'm just going to set a uh, set a game rules for people to actually uh, uh, follow and and basically flow in the ecosystem and let people to choose how would they want to govern the whole ecosystem. So." Moving coming back to the technology, I, I felt that this was the actual gold mine that we were we were sitting on and we just didn't didn't identify, because back in 20, 2012, I was also studying other technologies. I was actually still in uni. I was still studying how uh, 
uh, AI is going to change the world, how big data is coming around. There was few problems that I felt that in the next five to six years we will encounter, which is will be one is trust. When we talk about AI, AI, if we let, let's say we, we let AI to, uh, we make more and more modern AIs where AIs are able to take better decisions. And then there's more and more data on a person, uh, on a person is being gathered. But what about privacy then, right? And then when we talk about uh, uh, financial systems that are being quite uh, obsolete and the technologies are quite outdated, I don't see the next five to 10 years when we have self-driving cars, taking my ATM card, walking to the car, poking it in, putting in my PIN numbers, getting an approval and getting in the car, or getting my cash and trying to put it like a vending machine in my driverless car or something like that, right? I didn't, I, whenever, let's say we have a, a self-driving taxi service in the future. I, every time when I look into futuristic movies, we always saw that payment was very simple. You had your ID, you would just walk around, you just you tab on something or you just approved it from your device and the payment is done and millions are just being transferred and the economy works in that way. So I was just you know like sitting down in one day and imagining how the future of money is going to look like, how the future uh, economy is going to look like and how the technologies will behave in the space. And AI became an interesting part of the con uh, an interesting part of the equation, an interesting part of the future, but I just couldn't trust AI. And I just couldn't trust a lot of these technologies that are going to be running up there. And that where I felt that blockchain can play a very important role of doing, becoming the trust technology, where you have a technology that can self, uh, 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 self manage uh, its uh, security, self manage its auditing, self manage its uh, compliance, and at the same be a kind of a decentralized kind of trust where no central party will be controlling it. In this case, you can have a more shared ecosystem where you can just walk in, you have your payment system on it, you have uh, your data on it, you have your identity systems on it, and you can control that. And you have rights in that ecosystem because the game rules are set that way. So it started to make a lot of sense to me. But before I jump ahead into the future, I think let's talk about what exactly is blockchain technology. So blockchain technology is one of the earliest successful implementation of a decentralized ledger technology, TLT. So it's actually, the, the, uh, the keywords are already in the name. It's distributed, so they are stored more than one location. It's a ledger, it's just like a Buku Lima Lima, and it's a technology of the Buku Lima Lima, which is stored across various uh, people. And distributed ledger, uh, ledger database is spread across several nodes, which is in the set, uh, next sentence explaining it, on a peer-to-peer -peer network, people-to-people, -to, -people, to make it simpler where each replicates depends uh, uh, which where each replicates and saves an, uh, an identical copy of the ledger and updates itself independently so just like what i was talking in the story earlier it's a technology that you know like self governs self replicate and it just obeys a game rule that has been set up by the developers and it and in this case it checks itself is it in compliance with that rules where in ai how do we actually de you know, decide if it's compliant or is it do behaving in such a way because AI has its belief systems and stuff that they actually can modify. But let's stick to blockchain for now and moving in, in uh, uh, before we can go in and understand what is distributed systems, because since we're talking about a distributed ledger technology, a system that is distributed, where it's given, uh, it's kept in uh, several nodes. We have to understand a bit on computer systems before we get into a distributed system. If not, it, it will just, uh, uh, it, you would just not get what the idea uh, uh, of, of this technology. So there are a few types of computer systems that exist. You have the central centralized systems, which where you have, uh, you, you have your uh, central computer and you have nodes that are connected to it. For an example, this is like a study group where you, uh, uh, or maybe a teamwork group where you actually have a leader, where the leader actually gets the information from the teacher on what are the assignments and what are things have to be done. And everybody else get the information from him that uh, what are the things have to be done uh, and uh, what are the deliverables and what are the tasks that each individual have to do, have to be divided among them. In this case, this one person becomes the person who holds most of the information. And at the same time, it actually, uh, kind of uh, moderates and at the same time manages all the other 
nodes that are actually connected to it. So in this case, if you look into a lot of our university system, let's say whenever we want to request data, we open, we call the server, the server gives us a website, and we know what are the courses being offered by the university. And let's say I want to register it for my next semester, I can choose and register it and, and just uh, and basically get into get my timetable of the class. So this is how a uh, system, uh, centralized system work mainly. You have one leader who actually manages uh, the network. But in a decentralized system, you have multiple leaders that are actually talking to each other. So imagine the uh, same um, uh, classroom, but all the leaders, are, there's a whole classroom-wide uh, assignment, and all the leaders have to talk to each other to, uh, to kind of uh, complete the goal. Let's say there's a, a fun fair coming around, or in Malaysia, we have a Hari Kentin, where you actually can uh, basically have to organize an activity. So let's say if a class had to organize an activity and there will be a leader with a sub team of decoration as a leader with a sub team of finance as a leader and a sub team of marketing. In this case, you have all the leaders uh, coordinating with each other and deciding what are the data they want to share, what are the new information, what are the new updates. So coming back in digital example from of the analogy, Imagine your Facebook, right? So you have Facebook server in Malaysia, you have Facebook server in Singapore, you have Facebook server in South Korea. And let's say if you move from Malaysia to Singapore and Singapore to South Korea, your data is stored here in Malaysia. So when you go here and log in, they have to fetch that information that where, you, where your host country is and give the information and copy the, the latest feeds uh, to Singapore. And let's say from there, you take a flight and you go to South Korea it will actually have to fetch the host information uh, from uh, Malaysia and get the latest feeds and what are the new, new information they should be showing in. So in this case, they all can coordinate with each other. But in a small group like this, all of it is relying on this one member and this one server over here, uh, and everybody else is just taking the information from, uh, from it. And it, it, is not, it is not like a decentralized system where you can have multiple servers dividing the task. Here, there's only one leader. And let's say the task is overwhelming, uh, often, like in my case, the leader will just go missing or the leader will get uh, overloaded and he would not really uh, uh, show up to classes or something like that. And then basically everybody else can't operate as well. So this is one of the reasons why whenever there's a peak time, you can see the bank system doesn't work or university systems doesn't work often or some of the government service systems doesn't work whenever they speak, like LHD and recently. It didn't really work out because of too many people asking for requests. But this distributed system is a bit different. It knows all the peers that are joining in, what are their, capa what are their capabilities. And let's say, imagine this in an analogy that this is a football game, or let's say it's a, let's say it's a futsal game, right? There's a, uh, a, ten aside, a five aside uh, game and there's uh, 10 people on the, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the ground and they're playing futsal at the moment. And often when you play futsal with your friends, we don't have a referee. We don't have a person counting for the scores. Everybody take care of the scores. Everybody govern the game. Let's say if the ball is out, everybody kind of decide, is it out or not out? Or if, if it was it considered a score or not score, what was the total score? Because there was a common set of game rules that has been understood by everybody. And, and every time when there's a majority saying that the total score was two, we take the answer of the majority. In this case, we don't have to rely on a captain or a mean leader to govern and tell us what is the truth of the network. Everybody can just operate in a set of rules. And whenever somebody new join in, let's say a new person want to learn how to play futsal, somebody who already know it will just teach him how to play futsal and what are the rules, and he can quickly start learning it. He don't have to go to a futsal sifu and sit down learning it. He can just learn it from one of the peers and he can get started in the game. Let's say you want to be a champion, then of course you have to go to a, a futsal guru. But let's say he wants to just learn the game, he just want to be a futsal player. It's very easy. You just learn from one of the peers that exist. Imagine the same things in computer, where computers just have a set of rules and they behave uh, in that network similarly. In this case, let's say if it's a file sharing system like uTorrent, in this case, uh, they, they know if let's say if somebody's requesting for a file, what should I do? If uh, if somebody if I have this file, what should I do? How should I share it? Uh, and uh, and in this case, they already know the rules of those file sharing systems, and they they can keep on the network keep on expanding, and the far the more it expands, the faster it gets. 
that's the reason government could not shut down uh, file sharing systems like uTorrent and things like that because they didn't have a central server running it. They just had a protocol which everybody is downloading it and running it, and they had to start shut down millions of computers and find them and locate them and shut them down to basically shut down uTorrent. And if they shut down a domain, there's always a second alternative or a third alternative, a third alternative of a uTorrent uh, website. Right? So in this case, that's not, uh, it's very difficult to shut down such a system that actually behaves in just a set of rules. And it's one of the most fastest scaling kind of systems as well. It's easy to scale because there's no requirement of an individual person to go in and convince others to use it. Once they download the protocol and they, they want to use the system, they're already a member and they're already another server running in the system. And they don't have to do heavy work. It's quite uh, low load. So in this case, uh, your computer don't have to be a server to use uTorrent. You just have to be one computer with internet. That's it. And you're already part of the whole network. So this was a very appealing system because if you imagine in future where we are talking about millions and millions of devices connecting uh, with 5G and faster internet, IoT devices coming in, we have wearable technologies coming in. Centralized and decentralized systems are already reaching a lot of its bottleneck where they will not be able to provide a fast, efficient enough infrastructure to basically do governance, to do uh, data sharing, to do technology, uh, uh, you know, like kind of exchange. When it comes to distributed system, it's now started to become more appealing because now it is very low bandwidth requirement. Everybody has uh, are playing according to certain rules. There's, then there is no need to keep on pinging a server hundreds of kilometers away to get an update. You can just get an update between the peers nearest to you. And in this case, the whole ecosystem can be much faster. But distributed system as its whole branch is quite huge. There's distributed computing, storage, and many different forms of other technologies that are emerging right now. But let's just talk about the DLT for today. Uh, I don't want to overload you with too much of other information. Uh, and uh, we'll touch more on the other aspects in our masterclass. Uh, so DLT, blockchain technology, it actually has many different ways of implementation. That's the reason in my Definition earlier, I said that blockchain technology, although it's the most famous and in a way the most hype, uh, but there's many other ways of implementing a distributed ledger or a, 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 a ledger database. Blockchain technology is one of the ways. So we'll be touching more in detail and more in, uh, you know, like uh, we'll break down every single aspect of blockchain technology in our masterclass. And especially in our developers masterclass, we'll also show you how to develop those uh, individual components to make a fully functioning blockchain technology. But in our cryptocurrency masterclass, we will also break down into how it actually works. So in the future, whenever you see a blockchain projects, you know how to actually judge them and identify where do they fall in, in this kind of a chart. Because if you look into a lot of the crypto and blockchain projects out there, there are some of them that actually are cloud systems, they're file systems, they're computing systems, they're a DAG, uh, they are, and often when we talk about uh, those projects, people just get confused. They're like, hey, what is this now? Is this blockchain? They think everything is starting from here and branching down, but actually no. There are many technologies that are already available and they are they are got nothing to do with the blockchain technology. Uh, they are, maybe blockchain technology is just powering their cryptocurrency, but what they actually are, are a file system, let's say. So in this case, uh, that's where their business model works on the file system. Blockchain technology might just be its crypto part. And it becomes very confusing for a lot of people to understand this because they do not know the fundamentals and the basics of the whole ecosystem and how the technologies are different from each other. And that was something which we'll touch in our masterclass as well. So in short, if you're from the whole uh, story that I explained, it's digitization of trust. Right, so we didn't have technologies, or how you know, like how can we you know, like kind of digitize our trust? We didn't have a lot of technologies that actually could do that. Although one of the ones would be cybersecurity. Everybody thinks that cybersecurity is one of the one who enables digital trust. Yes, but uh, you definitely need uh, to to trust some systems. You need com uh, reliability towards it. You need consistency from it, and you know need to know that the system will always play in the common set of uh, governance rules, it won't, cannot go uh, exceeding it, right? That's what are some of the uh, concepts or ideas in technology that were required to build trust in those systems. 
if let's say tomorrow your system uh, it's uh, it can easily be hacked or can easily be changed or some one or two parties can decide what will be its future it is very difficult to trust it and continuously using it re and relying on it so in this case if you want to rely more on technologies we have to build such such a trust system where we can ensure privacy can ensure security ownership uh, and uh, uh, and transparency uh, of that ecosystem so in short is digital of trust security transparency decentralized and democratization of governance temper resistantness i'll talk more about this in our masterclass on how blockchains are temper resistant and not immutable uh, programmability we couldn't we didn't have a lot of flexibility of programming financial assets previously with blockchain recently we started doing a lot of that where we started doing more and more applications where like such, such as smart contracts uh, defi applications flash loans and many other things where you actually uh, can automate a lot of your financial processes and easier data access for participants uh, participating parties in this case all the parties that should have those information they have easily available to them and they can be one of the auditors or validators of the ecosystem so now cryptocurrencies for the last 11 years is being validated by the community the community is making sure that nobody hacking it or nobody is gaining on the system whenever there is somebody will be reporting it uh, and uh, and putting out that oh somebody just hacked a system or somebody just uh, tried to tamper with the blockchain and all of the data is available uh, on a public network for this for the case of bitcoin and in and you have to see since blockchain are designed modularly because there's just a set of piece of programming and codes you can decide what are the values and what are systems that you want to maintain for your application uh, let's say if you're building a business centric uh, supply chain application let's say you don't have to put all those values of bitcoin into your supply chain application you can decide maybe i need uh, transparency between my members. I don't need to show to the whole world what are the trades that are happening on my uh, chain. I just need for, let's say, uh, for the case of this rubber trade or the parties between this rubber trade able to see the information. You don't have to create APIs and servers and all that stuff. You just have a day, you have a blockchain where all three of you all run and jointly contribute the resources. And then you can share the data easily as well. And you can control what are the data they can add in and what are the data you can add in and further customize it according to your need. So it's just a piece of codes that you actually can pick up and customize further on your needs. But just to, just to give an introduction to the people who have never heard about Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies uh, or blockchain before, that's the reason we start with Bitcoin because that's where it was founded from and that's where some of the values that where it came out from, right? So if you take the Bitcoin tail as an example, it has been, it is having 99.98% uptime for the last 10 years. Among the best applications doesn't have that much of uptimes as well. Some of them are only 80% uptime. Some of them are 85, some of the 90, but Bitcoin has 99.98% uptime of in the last 10 years. And there are more than 43 million users worldwide, and it's actually growing during uh, MCO. The whole ecosystem grew uh, quite mu much faster. I think it'll be much, might be hitting 50 million right now, but I'm waiting for somebody to come up with a report about it. Then uh, it's an, it's running in the most, it, in an open and hostile environment for the last um, uh, 11 years, almost 11 years now. Uh, and uh, every government's tried to shut it down, hackers tried to shut it down. Uh, and a lot of uh, uh, other parties that were such as finance and banks was trying to resist it, but it's still there. And it's been proven resilient against DDoS attacks, Sybil attacks, SQL injections, and many other sort of security threats that, you know, like out there that actually, uh, uh, which are actually affecting a lot of businesses that are operating. But Bitcoin did that without having a firewall, without actually customizing your network, they just have random computers, people with, you know, like simple computers plugging in into Bitcoin network and, and basically just using the protocol. And the protocol self-defended itself from all these sort of attacks. So the protocol, protocol was good enough where it didn't need any external applications to support or defend it. So that's the reason it, it has been quite secure because the bigger the network grow, the more secure it gets. 
and it has a simple recovery and verification system. In this case, every time like a node goes down, it can easily check what is the most adopted uh, blockchain version and then just download it and just recover itself and start start doing uh, transactions again. That's the reason it's having 99.98% uptime all the time. Data, it's being temper resistant. So in this case, it's very hard to change any Bitcoin data. It spends, you can spend up, let's say if you want to go up five years back and uh, change uh, your Bitcoin value so you can become a millionaire right now, you'll be spending millions of dollars to change that data because you have, you'll be spending it in electricity amount because you have to fight against the whole network with more electricity than what you know, like uh, uh, than the whole network is actually uh, u- uh, using right now, and, and spend all that money just to change a sing- single uh, data variable. Standardized collaboration. So since the protocol is standardized, so everybody, every network that comes in, it can be running from a, a IoT device, can be can be running on a PC, it can be running on an ASIC, it can be run in multiple other things. And uh, the Bitcoin node, uh, it's, it's it's still uh, uh, easy uh, easy to collaborate with. Reduce the cost of uh, doing finance. So now it's uh, if you compare with uh, uh, a lot of other cryptocurrencies uh, today that are in market, there some of them can do much cheaper because they're much newer. But if you if you compare it with traditional finance, it's much cheaper to do finance. Let's say remittance, payments, uh, loans, and all that stuff on on Bitcoin actually. It comes to become, became a mechanism of digital trust, uh, and it also became a mechanical uh, a mechanism of digital trust. So, going into the questions that we wanted to answer today uh, in this webinar, since I'm already running out of time, so I'm just going to go quickly on this. So, what are the opportunities in the blockchain industry? Is what I wanted to uh, answer in the today's webinar. And previously, yeah, I think it's quite hard to get into them without understanding briefly what is blockchain and where is the whole concept going towards. So coming in, I feel there's going to be a huge amount of disruption and the way we've been doing um, finance and insurance, healthcare, governance, compliance, supply chains, legal services, property market, intellectual properties, and resource management. And in this few years, I think there's going to be a, a lot of disruptions and there's a possibility some of these industries might have a complete reshape and some of them might just poof, vanish, right? But is it exactly? I It's just that I feel that there's going to be new business models. I'm not saying that they're just going to go vanish completely, just like uh, the tenor snap indicated earlier. I feel that there's going to be new business models because today I can run a cryptocurrency without an auditor, without you know, like a, a lot of security requirements. I can do the payment, uh, payment services much cheaper and in this case, all the you know like uh, flaws and flaws of auditors and flaws and flaws of bankers, security people that are sitting down uh, and trying to secure uh, you know like financial services today, they will basically need to rethink uh, or you know like uh, reskill themselves into different segments. Because if tomorrow a fintech startup comes out or a fintech bank comes out and do all these activities at a fraction of cost and able to capture a sizable market size, most of the big banks will feel the pressure, will feel the pinch because they are running, let's say for one loan, they have like three to five people working at the back where most of these fintech companies just have, have an application where you can apply a loan from. So the cost of running that is just server costs, right? But when it goes on a blockchain system, it actually reduces way more costs than just a fintech company. It will be much cheaper to run a fintech application on blockchain than running a Alipay, for example. So it's cheaper to run an, uh, a crypto app than Alipay at the moment because it's being self-governed. And a lot of times it's also being governed by community. So even the person running the uh, software or running that project do not pay for it. It's the community who's actually paying for it and they have an incentive system to do it. That's one of the reasons for the last, since 2017, there has been a big uh, growth in the ecosystem. There has been a lot of, uh, there was a huge bubble that was growing in. Everybody was issuing cryptocurrency wallets, cryptocurrency payment, uh, cryptocurrency coins. And every single one, uh, a lot of people was rushing in to also buy those coins, to participate in their network. And the whole, the whole, com- the whole ecosystem kind of growth after that. So, Today, the, uh, in the decentralized economy, if you look into, uh, I'll try to briefly, briefly put it as a decentralized economy. DeFi is one of the biggest section. 
uh, there's actually many other uh, sections in that uh, in the decentralized economy where DeFi is one of the biggest one right now, where you can see payment, banking, insurance, credit. Credit providers is uh, currently growing really big, especially providing credit for trades, trading markets, lending, gambling, trade finance. Trade finance is also picking up really fast. A lot of major companies are coming in. Uh, to basically uh, do trade finance on blockchain. There are accumulation banks as well who are involved uh, and, uh, and basically uh, doing some sort of POCs and testings. Uh, then uh, even uh, regionally, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, financial institutes that are getting involved to lower down trade finance costs, asset and risk management, uh, financial uh, analysis. One of the problems with financial analysis is transparency, right? You don't have the data available to understand what is the real economical impact of COVID, let's say now. You need to go in and get from the government. Government have to really pressure a lot of the banks, the financial systems, the businesses to identify and notify them what are the business impacts. And you, you are still not certain, is it a true information, right? Sometimes some people might just fake their figures, but then you have to do compliance and auditing of the numbers. Are they true, right? And often we don't do it. We just take it as a, a kind of a guide to tell what is the possible impact, but we just usually put up a plus minus percentage on it. That's it. But if let's say we have more transparency on the data that is available to us, we know this many trades happen and this many trades fail because of COVID, we can do better financial analysis and better financial decisions, better business management. So in this case, it's, uh, it is, uh, it is, yeah, this is where you can really see the value of a blockchain system uh, powering our local economy. Scoring and compliance, uh, this has been one of the big areas that has been, uh, there's a lot of fraud for the last few years. Uh, we've been hearing since 2008 where there was a lot of uh, scoring companies or uh, rating companies uh, in America, as they, as they say, uh, rating companies of assets where they were giving uh, false uh, ratings on uh, uh, stocks or bonds and everything. Let's say even it's a garbage asset. A lot of people were just rating it as double A or a triple A asset that can be traded traded on uh, on the markets. So in this case, a lot of fraud happened in that space as well. And in this case, they, uh, it was quite difficult uh, for them as well to uh, uh, to basically track back were they actually good assets because they didn't have transparency on what were the underlying uh, assets and what were the underlying performance of the underlying assets as well. Security, reg tech, insure tech, fintech, KYC services, all of this can be simplified. Recently, uh, government Bank Nagara, uh, sorry, yeah, Bank Nagara just uh, came up with a statement that they want to simplify onboarding of uh, bank users and, uh, and you know, like uh, for opening up bank accounts by using KYC services, digital KYC services. Uh, but what if we had digital IDs right now, right? If, if Malaysia would have, you know, like think one step ahead and we actually develop digital IDs, they were, uh, maybe based on blockchain where everybody has control on the data that they, they are using. But, uh, but in this case, they don't need to go through another EKYC. Because right now, if, if I had a digital ID, I can just go and click on every single fintech wallet and say that I want to register an account and just click one button and I'm already registered. But if I, since I don't have that, I have to go through EKYC process in every single bank, every single fintech application, every single place where I have to verify my identity. I have to go in and put out my IC, give them my information, give them my data and get it verified and then use that fintech application. And then I'm still displacing a lot of my information, which becomes a privacy risk to me because now multiple fintech companies and you know like uh, exchanges are actually holding my data. What if they're misusing my data or what if they get hacked? Because they're, because uh, my information is already on the dark net because last DG got hacked, my uh, I started to get a lot of prank calls and so yeah, a lot of uh, scam calls telling uh, that, uh, you know, like I have loans here that have need to do repayments and stuff like that because my data is already up on uh, on uh, on the net for people to use. And basically, and a lot of times it sounds very convincing when they have my actual data, right? And uh, not getting too deep into it, let's just go into the other sectors. Uh, there's also other industries are really booming, especially the gaming and esports industry. Esports, there's multiple projects, uh, you know, like there's, uh, there are, Teams, esports teams that are being funded via crypto. There are people, uh, uh, people uh, uh, funding their, uh, the teams according with cryptocurrencies. They have digital collectibles for people who are supporting those esports games. There are games that are being built on decentralized network. So uh, if you if you remember the movie Ready Player One, a lot of the concepts that you see in that movie are possible because if you use blockchain, 
where even the owners or the developers of the games could not take over the game because it was built on a shared network if you if you watch that movie similarly like that there's a lot of new platforms like decentraland there's uh, decentra and few other projects that are coming up they're building decentralized games where the, all the the assets that are built you're building up on the game or your all the credits that you're earning in the game are yours you have complete ownership on them and tomorrow let's say when the game company shut down there's going to be multiple other integrations that are already available that you can move from your assets from one game to another game it's a whole uh, new future of gaming that is being developed uh, uh, enabled by decentralized technology entertainment uh, also is a, it's also creating uh, it's also booming right now people are creating applications where you can pay directly to the artist instead of going through platforms and uh, and also pay by consumption basically if you're hearing the song for 10 minutes maybe you just want to sorry for 2 minutes then you only want to pay for those 2 minutes let's say if you're watching the movie for 15 minutes then you want to only pay for this 15 minutes of the movie so in this case you know you pay by how much you consume instead of subscribing to so many different digital platforms and never watching them data market digital collectible healthcare prop tech law tech decentralized security manufacturing tech every single thing that you you know like we think about that requires trust there is blockchain coming in and in some places in awaiting it in some place outright disrupting it because they will come in if if you want blockchain to really bring value in those ecosystem the whole way of bringing those technology system have to change and in certain places they are just a value add service where they just come in let's say in gaming if you do it on decentraland oh you can actually uh, have a more shared ecosystem more people will support it so people can just start playing new games or the game can have a new update let's say but in certain areas like let's say talk about law tech there's going to be a lot of disruption prop tech there's going to be a lot of disruptions as well there's a lot of compliance disruption that will happen so before uh, so there's uh, some of the industries that are coming in so what's happening in malaysia since march there has been a new regulation on iu talk there has been a, a uh, a per, uh, per, there's a new talk that has started by SE basically to come up with uh, the guidelines. There's Luno uh, started, did a new trading pair. TM said that they would like to eliminate passwords by uh, adopting blockchain. Binance said that they will support, uh, they will support Malaysian Ringgit. Uh, then there was a talk about uh, adopting uh, palm oil, uh, blockchain in palm oil for traceability surveys. Binance said they will release their debit card here in Malaysia. So a lot of positive news started since March. And, and if you go into April and May, then there's actually a lot of other stories. I just didn't include them in because they were very, they were not related to this class today, uh, but they are about crypto class and crypto stuff that's happening in uh, uh, Malaysia as well. There's new exchanges, there's new uh, uh, exchanges that have already start operating in Malaysia. There's some partnership of those exchanges that the, uh, the last few months we've been hearing. There's exchanges that went through uh, uh, new security updates. Then I think the most recent one and interesting one will be uh, uh, by uh, the uh, PN government that they said that they will be doing a joint committee on uh, doing uh, blockchain together. Uh, this was a release in June. Then uh, Luno just listed uh, 22 hours ago. They said that they will be listing Litecoin uh, from Tuesday. And uh, then today, the, another news was released by SC saying that Sharia Advisory Council permits the trade of digital assets. Uh, told by the chairman. So every day there's new news on cryptocurrencies, on blockchain, there's new adoptions, there's new company forming in, there's new investments happening. There's also a few weeks back, there was actually a, a takeover of a digital ID company by Green Packet uh, and, um, and many new interesting stuff happening in the space. So you will be keep hearing a lot of this stuff happening in the background because you'll be wondering like, where is cryptocurrencies, where's blockchain, what's happening? It's actually, there's new things happening every day. And I think the next few months we'll be hearing some more exciting news because there's going to be more blockchain activities happening in Malaysia. But once I think I won't be, I don't want to jump the gun and uh, uh, share that information now. And once it's uh, it's available, I think maybe in the next masterclass I will I will, I will actually share it. So uh, I think I briefly explained this earlier. Uh, I will not go in, but this was supposed to be a more detailed like uh, uh, ex example. But I'll share the slides since we're running out of time. I will not want to jump into it. So implementation challenges, right, of blockchain. One of the problems that we have uh, of implementing blockchain uh, 
is one of them is interoperability. We have invested in a lot of old systems and systems from years, and a lot of them are many different versions of those systems. Some are built on old technology, some are built on Java, some are built on JavaScript, or some are built on C. In this case, a lot of the pro programs and codes were developed for being self-sufficient and you're like sufficient to do their operations, but not to integrate with something else. So that's the reason a lot of times when we talk about integration, a lot of these technologies are very outdated where we don't have, either we can't find the skills or we can't find people who understand those codes. And that becomes a challenge for integration. So a lot often people tell me why, like why a lot of startups are boarding onto blockchain, but not a lot of legacy companies or old companies that are actually boarding on them because they have a lot of legacy data and networks as well that are already up there. So for them to bring up and adopt blockchain, they have to first think of how they're going to maintain with the legacy and how important of bringing the legacy. Because in certain areas, the legacy is not very important. They just have to move their user account. Let's say we talk about gaming, right? You just update the new thing. You don't really care about the old one because nobody really going to be playing version, the earlier version. They just need the new version and people start playing the new version. And in this case, like once the version is like more than two or three times, uh, two or three versions old, nobody plays the game, uh, the old game anymore. The latest version is the the, the one uh, uh, everybody's playing now. So they can cut the support for that. So they do not have a lot of interoperability and legacy network challenges. But when we talk about other ecosystems, when we talk about trading systems, we talk about uh, financial systems, they actually have a lot of legacy data, accounts that were created 20, 30 years ago who have, the, who have some money and their database is there. How can we digitize them? How can we actually... Uh, uh, take those data and integrate them with the new blockchain network. That has been one of the challenges, core challenges. And But why those are the challenges is because we don't have skill sets. We don't have people who can who understands blockchain, understand how to implement blockchain, and can actually go in, understand those previous systems, modify them, and basically bring them onto blockchain and also bring the data from the previous networks onto blockchain. So that's one of the problems. We do not have the skill sets to do that. It's not that we can't do it. The technology is there. The systems are there. We don't have the skill sets to do it. That's one of the issues. And then also, yes, we are lacking a, a methodology of the whole system. We lack also some of the standards. We lack some, lack some, of, the, uh, uh, lack some of the definitions that require. Mass adoption is still a challenge because there's a lot of... Uh, 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 I think one of the wrong approaches a lot of blockchain companies did, they actually over glorified blockchain that people think that they have to understand it and they under represent the ideas and their application. So people today know blockchain, but they do not know what are the applications that has been successful out there. They sold the concept of blockchain, but they never sold the application. But if they went in and sell the application, let's say, hey, this is the new version of Facebook. Okay, then people just use it. I think one of the marketing approach has been one of the uh, uh, has been wrongly executed, but I think mass adoption once there is uh, mainstream acceptance uh, and there's more skill sets available out there to uh, customize and ma manage those technologies, mainstream adoption will not really be a big challenge afterwards. And if we can actually see it during the COVID time, adoption actually uh, grew much faster. There's a lot of companies and a lot of new. Even UNICEF and UN have started to explore more on blockchain and they started to give out some cryptocurrency grants now. And uh, cost challenges, because a lot of these legacy systems for a lot of MSEs and uh, SMEs, they actually have to spend a lot of money to update your systems. So uh, I think uh, we're about reaching time towards the end of this session today. So uh, just wanted to recap that uh, the Blockchain Masterclass, a guide to the cryptocurrency is coming soon on the 30th of Jan. 30th of uh, July, as was actually shared by Elizabeth earlier. It's going to be from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. That's the QR code below. I, I believe uh, we will also share it in the comment section later for you to sign up. And it's all, also going to be available on iTrain's website. So Blockline is working with iTrain to provide this class, we, to work on this class. Other than that, we're also working with iTrain to bring in a developers class, which is also available on iTrain's website, which is the uh, blockchain uh, developers, uh, blockchain certified associate developers class, uh, and it's this is a, a much longer, uh, longer class where we can talk about segments and segments of uh, blockchain and how do they work and actually try coding them, coding blockchain from a scratch. It's a bit technical, so that's the reason we we uh, focus more on computer science and people who have computer science and IT background. So if people who are willing, who wants to uh, become blockchain developers. 
they should look towards uh, uh, the BCAT class. And people who are looking towards understanding what a cryptocurrency is, what the values, how it exists, and how should you like get into it, and what are things you should understand before getting into it. I think that's where this beginner's guide to cryptocurrency uh, is actually uh, basically positioned at. So uh, why you consider BCAT? It is actually one of the sexiest job around. It has been uh, one of the top emerging jobs. Uh, and there's a high, high amount of job applications, uh, sorry, job uh, uh, ads that are actually being popped up every day, even during the toughest of times where a lot of companies and tech companies are laying off, blockchain companies has doubled down on hiring. And that's, that's the reason actually even a lot of uh, companies are actually sending us resumes and asking us if you want to hire people and stuff. We started to get a bit of overload on that as well. But... Uh, I'll think that currently a lot of tech, a lot of blockchain companies has gone back to R&D and started to develop new products. There's, and then I think in, even in Malaysia itself, it's going to be easily five or six new companies that are going to come in in the next few years, uh, maybe less than a year, actually, five or six uh, companies. I think there's going to be start hiring more people. And uh, hopefully, we're gonna, we, we, uh, I think that that's actually going to support the local economy quite a lot. And the government believe by 2025, uh, Malaysia is going to be adopting blockchain in many of its sectors. It was actually a report that was actually put out by MITE. And interestingly, Malaysia, as we said, blockchain is one of the distributed ledger systems. Malaysia is actually quite ranked quite high in uh, the best, uh, best developer talent that we have in the world for distributed systems. And interestingly, I noticed that a lot of uh, other unis don't touch it. But when I was in my university, we did talk a lot about distributed systems. Just thing we didn't talk about it as a blockchain. We talked it about as a distributed network, grid computers, and things like that. But Malaysia do have the talent that is already available. We have the teaching talent available for it. Maybe in the next few years, we might we have the possibility of being a blockchain hub of the world. So with that, I think uh, we are run out of time. And uh, I will actually open it up for a question and answer session. And uh, Elizabeth, I think I'll, I'll give it to you to uh, maybe govern or give me the questions. Hi, Harpreet. Thank you very much for giving the presentation. Um, at the moment, we are still waiting for any questions. So if anybody has any questions, you can write them in the comments section. But uh, yes, for everybody who wants to join for the master class, you can find the link. And it's, uh, yeah, so it's bit.ly slash itrain3007. All right, we haven't gotten any more questions, but uh, yes, those who are still on, you can... Uh, Register for the master class at the first link you can see. Then uh, please fill out also the feedback form. And the feedback form is the second bitly link by the ending of iTrain webinar. And once you fill out the feedback, uh, once you fill out the feedback form, you will also gain access to the webinar recording and the presentation. And yeah. If you have any questions for iTrain, you can email those to info at itrain.com.my. Yeah. And then there's going to be a lot of uh, rewatch uh, of the video as well later on. If there's any question, maybe you can just tag me up there uh, and I'll be able, I'll be happy to come down in the comments and answer it, answer it there as well. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for the presentation tonight.